ladies and gentlemen. I will talk about uh, Glückel von Hameln. She is like uh, nobody else uh, destined uh, to be an example uh, uh, of what is the topic of our conference uh, to prove that Yiddish is not an alien language but part of the German culture's language, etc. We have heard about that a great deal. In 2004, a volume was published with contributions uh, to an Israeli conference entitled Men and Women, Gen Judaism and Democracy, which uh, took place in 1998. The editor, professor of Jewish studies at the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem, my friend Rachel Elior, she wrote in her foreword, I quote, for thousands of years from the antiquity to the 20th century, written Jewish culture was created exclusively by men. End of the quote. I reviewed the book for a Krakow magazine and had to disagree with uh, the esteemed colleague. She clearly did not know the authors of the Yiddish women's prayers, the Trinis, which were first printed from the 16th century and were very popular in the 17th and 18th century in Western Eastern Europe. While they were still written primarily by men in the West, however, they were increasingly written by uh, women in the East. Neither did Mrs. Ilior nor Leah Horowitz of Bolecho nor Leah Dreisel of Zell, daughter of the Maggit of Dubno, Jakob Ben Wolfkranz, and who wrote these supplications in the early century, nor did she know Glückel von Hameln. But Yiddis and Hamburgers do know her, for since the publication of the manuscript of her memoirs by the Budapest scholar David Kaufmann in 1890, he had been editing uh, them since 1892. It was a hard work for them. She has been known in the German-speaking world. Glückel is the first German Jewish autobiographer whose memoirs give us an authentic information about the not easy everyday life, the level of education and the idiom of the Jews in Germany, as well as about the historical circumstances that shaped the Jewish life. The historical background, uh, her private reminiscences and uplifting stories. Born in Hamburg in uh, 1645 to the wealthy merchant family of Judah Joseph Ben Nathan, also known as Leib or Leib Pinkel and she was not actually predestined to be an author as a pious Jewish woman. Uh, of modern times, one of six uh, children. Her father was a jewel merchant and community elder. Her mother also a bus businesswoman. Her parents also provided for her daughter a good education for that time. And the, so Glückel was an educated, courageous, and energetic, uh, bound to tradition, religious, but at the same time, independent, energetic, and business-minded. I could go on like that, uh, but we don't have time enough. As a mother of so many children, or, and tw that 12 of them remained alive, was a rarity. So she was the... Uh, a prototype of today's modern multitasker, and on the other hand, quite similar to the biblical ideal of a J Jewish wife, uh, Asia's Heil, uh, as you find them in the Proverbs of Solomon 31, 10 to 31. In this hymn, sung every Sabbath to the valiant dream wife, are lines like these. I quote now. That is Luther's uh, translation. Die ist viel edler denn die köstlichsten Perlen. Ihr Mann's Herz tarnt sich auf sie verlassen und Nahrung wird ihm nicht mangeln. Sie tut ihm liebs und kein Leids sein Leben lang. Sie tut ihren Mund auf mit Weisheit und auf ihrer Zunge ist Holz. To him that hath a virtuous wife, she is far more precious than finest pearls. His man's heart can rely on her, and he will not want her for food. He, she will love him and uh, not do no harm to him. Um, Gluckel's, uh, um, she did not only uh, she, she she wrote the memoirs uh, not f 
for foreign readers, only for her descendants. My dear children, I wrote this also, that if uh, today or tomorrow your dear children or grandchildren come and they do not know the family, I may have this set up shortly that you may know what sort of people you are from. Since Glückel report that uh, she was... Uh, uh, not quite uh, three years old at the time of expulsion of Jews from Hamburg in 1648. She also shows us how unstable and uncertain the situation of Jews has always been, which is in danger of being lost in the frenzy of the celebrations to mark 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany. Hamburg owed its development uh, into a flourishing cosmopolitan port city, not least since uh, about 1600 to the influx of wealthy Portuguese Jews who as uh, conversos, also Christos Novos or pejoratively Marans, were baptized Christians but continued to secrete secretly adhere to the Jewish religion. They were opposed by the Lutheran clergy, taxed very heavily, and many of them emigrated to Amsterdam at the end of the 17th century, very much to the detriment of Hamburg. At the same time, the Ashkenazi Jews, or uh, High German Jews, as the Senate called them, began to move to Hamburg and build up their community. At that time, actually, these German Jews uh, were um, named like that. These Jews had been given the status of uh, Schutzjuden, uh, protected Jews, uh, 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 so say they got the permission to settle among them was Glückel's father as the first who had lived in Hamburg since the, nine, since the 1630s. Glückel, who had, uh, after all, spent over 50 years of her life there, reflected on this because in Hamburg, where Jews were regarded as blasphemers in contrast to Altano and therefore always considered uh, undesirable. They were not allowed to establish a synagogue and a Jewish cemetery until 1654 in a residential building. The first real synagogue building was even consecrated very late in 1860, and uh, the Jews had been there for more than 250 years, uh, the Ashkenazi one. Lücke writes, I was born in Hamburg, but as I have heard from my dear parents uh, and also from others, I was not three years old when all the Jews were expelled from Hamburg. All had to move to Altena, who belonged to His Majesty the King of Denmark, and where all Jews had good living. Altena is hardly a quarter of an hour of away from Hamburg. At that time, there were already about 25 Jewish households in Altano, and there we also had our synagogue and our cemetery, not in Hamburg. So she says and continues, so it has been that we have had temporary peace and have been temporarily chased away again until today. I fear that this will continue as long as we are in Hamburg and as long as the Bürgerei rules in Hamburg. In the 17th century, uh, uh, Jews uh, uh, such as Glückel's translator into German, Alfred Falchenfeld, wrote uh, uh, in his introduction, and they were among the least respected uh, estates and classes of the people of the Holy Roman Empire and German nation. The large imperial trading cities of the German north had closed their gates to the Jews for the longest time and harassed them as best as they could. In the neighboring city of Altena, now a district of Hamburg, on the other hand, which belonged to the Count of Holstein Schaumburg and after 1640 to the King of Denmark, they were able to live relatively undisturbed for a certain period of time. Glückel's books of uh, the first phase describe the life of Jews both in Hamburg and in Altena. It was the time of the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. Uh, which started as a religious war but ended up as a territorial war and took place mainly on the territory of the empire. It brought devastation, famine, and epidemics. Um, in such times, the Jews uh, were even more in danger than usual, and Glückel wrote all that down. Quote, as much as I'm aware of and as much as I 
as can be done, I will describe from my youth what I still remember that had happened. End of the quote. With her 28 years uh, and with her private notes, uh, Glückel has gone down in in the annals of the first, as the first Jewish woman in German Je Jewish history to write. She wrote the seven volumes of her diaries at night uh, in Hebrew letters in the Judeo-German idiom that was uh, still in use at the time. At the end of the 17th and uh, beginning of the 18th century, which uh, identified the Ashkenazi Jews as German Jews and which developed uh, further as Yiddish for the shepherd, shepherds from Portugal spoke Portuguese. Uh, and critical memoirs are an important, so you know, it contained numerous Hebraisms. And Glückel's memoirs are an important source of knowledge uh, of everyday life, the cultural history of Jews in Germany, and Yiddish philology. On the one hand, very personal, as she always emphasized. On the other hand, uh, uh, recording the historical events of her time. Her work, like her personality, represents a great exception. Thus, uh, as an autobiographer, Glückel thus ranks a must among the most important Jewish authors of modern time, comparable to Leone la Moderna, who lived from 1571 to 1648. However, the original manuscript is lost, but her son, Moses Hamel, rabbi of Beiersdorf, had, a, had published a copy now in the city and uh, uh, University Library of Frankfurt under the title Siriones Maras Memoirs of a Woman, Glickel Hamil, which uh, uh, was uh, translated by Bertha Pappenheim in 1910 into German and in 1913 by Alfred Faltenfeld. Um, in uh, 1657, at the age of 12, uh, she was engaged to, uh, to Chaim von Hamel, son of merchant Joseph Ben Habaruch by Daniel Samuel. Halevi, also known as Joseph uh, Goldschmidt uh, and Joseph Hamel, later an internationally active precious metal and jewelry ta trader. At the age of uh, 14, her, their marriage took place and they moved into Chaim's family home in Hamelin. In 1661, five years later, the young couple moved into the rented house at, uh, in in Hamburg's Neustadt and Ashkenazi quarter. Jews were separated. So then the birth of 14 children followed uh, from then on. Uh, it was a very ha happy, two of them died. It was a very happy, harmonious, and partnership like union, unusual for the time and for an arranged marriage. Um, she was uh, very happy, and uh, she. Mm, she uh, had supported her, and he didn't do anything without the uh, support and uh, the approval of his wife. That is how it should be. In January 1689, her husband Chaim died, and two years later, in uh, at the age of 45, she began to write down a diary and her thoughts, write down her thoughts during the night. So she was left alone with eight children still. Four were already out of the house, and she now had to manage the business alone to support the large family in, some, un, in uncertain times in which, as she also describes, all kinds of dangers lurked for trading Jews, uh, whether on the way to and from the fairs, for example, to Leipzig or Frankfurt, Oder, to which they were only admitted after payment of a high Leibzoll, as to say the Jews could not uh, simply go there, which at the time had to be paid in cash, of course. And thus, uh, the Jews uh, went uh, with their commodities and uh, their money in their pockets uh, on foot or with a backpack. Uh, they went to these places uh, in case they were rich and was not very safe. One of uh, their assistants was a young man from Poland who spoke Polish very well, which was uh, probably important for international context, especially with non-use, because otherwise Jewish German would have been sufficient. This young helper 
was murder, murdered by robbers uh, on this one journey on foot from Hanover to Hildesheim. Glückel's husband was also exposed to all kinds of dangers on his travels. She writes, sometime after this, my husband traveled to the Leipzig fair and became very ill in Leipzig. At the time, it was very dangerous for Jews in Leipzig because if, God forbid, a Jew had died there, it would have cost him everything he had. Glückel then traveled as a woman uh, alone as well, taking great risks. But despite these uh, hardships, uh, her business went surprisingly well. Glückel also reports, for example, on the plague epidemic in Hamburg in 1664, from which she fled with her young daughter to her parents-in-law in Hameln. So epidemics, uh, robbers, etc., she, all, she survived all that. Of great importance to this day are Glückel's descriptions of inner Jewish history. For example, the uh, riots uh, over the alleged Messiah Sabbatai Tzvi, 1626 to 1676, described in detail in Book 3, against the general historical background of Europe on the threshold of a new age. In 1666, she witnessed the Sabbatianism, hysteria that gripped especially Sephardic Jews in many countries. But not a few of the Ashkenazim also sold their possessions and did penance to before setting uh, sail from Hamburg for the Holy Land. Glückel's father-in-law, too, sold his house in Hameln, sent some traveling boxes to his son in Hamburg, and moved to Hildesheim to wait for the right time to move there. But in the same year, uh, the a Jew from Smyrna, Sabbatai Zwi, converted to Islam, thus ending the hope uh, for redemption of Israel at the rebuilding of the Jerusalem Temple. This is the only time Glückel reports uh, contacts with the Sephards uh, through whose network news of the Messiah spread. Zwi is said to have had a vision that he was a prophet when he heard of the massacres of the Jews in the Ukraine under the Cossack heretic Bogdan Khmelnytsky in 1648. These programs cost the lives of 100,000 Jews and were considered uh, the worst before Hitler. At that time, many Ukrainian Jews fled to the West, including Hamburg, bringing their Yiddish dialect with them, fleeing back and forth with a constant uh, a feature among the Jews in Europe. The dashed hopes plunged these sorely tried Jews into a deep crisis. It led, among other things, to the emergence of a new optimistic movement in Eastern Europe, Hasidism, whose founding writings were written in Yiddish. In addition to the historical events, the family events took up a great deal of space. Glickel, blessed with a large family, had a lot to tell. For example, around uh, 1674, Glückel and her husband brought her 13-year-old eldest uh, daughter, Sipora, to Kleber for her wedding. Sipora's 18-year-old uh, husband, Kosman, was a son of the Brandenburg court Jew Elias Gompertz. Uh, there had already been family ties to the Gompertz family and even the later Brandenburg uh, elector and Prussian King Frederick uh, and the governor of Kleve, Moritz von Nassau, were present at Zipporah's splendid weddings. They did not uh, show up and at, no, at weddings of... Uh, in important people. In Glückel's work, two phases or periods have to be distinguished. The first of five chapters or volumes she wrote as a widow of her first, and the last two, chapter six and seven, as the widow of her second husband. As an efficient widow, Glückel carried on a business alone, providing for the education of her children at uh, home and abroad, and for mer matches. Um, her daughter in Kleber was one of those. In the difficult life situation and out of many worries and hardships and heartaches, she began to write. According to her daily 
would work. Because public intellectual space was closed to Jewish women until the Enlightenment, Glückel's memoirs were not intended for public consumption, and also because they contain detailed accounts of business, financial, and family matters such as births, illnesses, wedding celebrations. She did, however, in order to set her children on a good path as righteous people and pious Jews, include many instructive stories from Jewish secular and moral liter literature that show Glückel to be both good fearing, God-fearing and for her time an especially educated woman. Pious as she was, she ended her first book with the words, I quote here, if we call upon God, praise be to him. With all our heart, he will not forsake us, and with the help will be our help and the help of all Israel, and will declare good and comfort to us, and will send us our Redeemer, our righteous Messiah, soon in our days. Amen. So be his will. That is to say, she added many re religious uh, phrases, uh, prayers, uh, and uh, uplifting uh, proverbs in her diaries and memoirs, Glücke gives amazingly precise details of her financial transaction. For example, she st starts, and this is an indiscretion today, quote, my father, the memori memory of the righteous be a blessing, has been a man of 8,000 uh, riches. That was quite a lot, probably. She also gave the amount of the respective dowries of her surviving, six of them uh, survived, marriageable daughters. Glückel made sure that her children married partners from well-off and learned families, and she was uh, naturally very proud of her Iris, her own distinguished family background and the good connections she had brought about for her children. She was a proverbial Yiddish mom, always concerned about the welfare of her family. Glückel herself, when she had only had her youngest <clears throat> daughter to provide for, and after she, mourning for her shame, had turned down many good lots, which she lamented, would have secured her wealth and honor in old age, and at the age of 54, on the advice of one, her sons of in-law, she finally decided, nevertheless, to remarry. It was the widower Hirz, Hirsch Serf Levy, a highly respected community leader in Metz, scholarly and rich as a banker. He was highly esteemed, and everybody trusted him. It seemed to become an ideal match after Glückel settled her affairs in Hamburg. As she also writes, she gave her husband all her money as a dowry. As he promised to take care of her youngest daughter, Miriam, then only 11 years old, and left everything that uh, she had as a heritage to, to their uh, husband. But just two years after their marriage, uh, in 1702, her husband's business collapsed uh, with many, including Glückel's son and herself, losing their money. His death was a heavy blow to her, as for she wrote it bitterly, her husband, uh, quote, left her in misery and gloom, and she had to leave his house immediately. Glückel, who all her life strove to be self-reliant and independent, not to be a burden to her children, had first to live in a chamber with a relative for three years and then to give up her independence altogether and move into the home of her wealthy daughter Esther and son-in-law Abraham Krummerswap. The children thanked her for her love and care, yet she found her old age and poverty and dependence undignified and suffered greatly. She had also never felt at home in the Jewish community at Metz, whose internal conflicts uh, that we know disturbed her. But this still, and however, she belonged to it until her death in 1724 at the then Methusreal 
age of almost 80. She finished records in 1719 and died five years later. Also physically, she was a very strong woman. She finished uh, her records in 1719, and five years later she died. Um, so text examples of Glückel's use of language. Since Glückel was a traditionally living and Jewish uh, educated woman, her style oscillated between Hebrew and German. And, uh, her parables, uh, fairy tales, fables, lady legends, uh, prayers are mainly borrowed from the Yiddish Women's Bible, Tsenerene, first published in 1590 and from the Midrash. Uh, they are the traditional elements of women's education at the time. The instructions uh, to the descendants are taken from the Torah, reflecting their Jewish education. Already her opening words show the mixture of languages uh, typical of Glückel diction, especially in texts that are religi religiously in origin, she writes Hebrew, where everyday life is described uh, in German. But as is the case with Ashkenazi Jews uh, to this day, her German as a colloquial language is often flavored with the sprinklings of Hebrew. I do have uh, a friend in Israel whose parents came from Lithuania, but she didn't speak Yiddish, only Hebrew. Uh, that was the, the parents of uh, uh, Rachel Rojanska yesterday. Her parents kept her uh, away from Yiddish, but every second word was Oigeva. So, oh my God, in Yiddish. So, but uh, she, she belonged to uh, the elder generation. I don't know whether it is still true for the young generation. She wrote. In Yiddish. Like in Eastern Yiddish. So in the better Pappenheim's translation, it reads like this. In the year 1691, I begin to write this. Out of many sorrows and distresses and heartaches, as shall further follow. But God please us as long time as he afflicted us and send our Messiah and Redeemer salvation soon. Amen. Glückel described the circumstances under which she began to write as follows. My dear children, I have begun this, Saduta Adenai, to write that after the death of my father, also ich schlaflos zugebracht und ich besorgt, dass ich Hasve Halila in Malikule Gedanken sollt kommen. Also ich oft bei Leila aufgestanden und die Schlafläusen Schaot damit zugebracht. Meine lieben Kinder, ich bin ach nicht äußen euch ein Sefer Musser zu machen und schreiben. Ich bin nicht kapabel dazu, dazu denn dem senden unsere Hachameno Sichronam Levacha gebucht. Ist er in Yam hineingefallen, Yam ist mehr, und wäre versoffen. Der Schiffer hat das gesehen und kam er strikt zu geworden. Feilchenfeld, uh, the translator, who uh, as, at his discretion has omitted many passages, especially of a religious nature, is a poor help here. Hence, Bertha Pappenheim, once again, who reproduces Glückel's addiction. Uh, this one has no punctuation, for example, somehow more faithfully. My dear children, I have begun to write this with God's help after the 
death of your pious father. And it has been good for me when melancholical thoughts uh, have come to me from heavy sorrows, when we were like a flock without a shepherd and we lost uh, our faithful shepherd. Certainly you understood a lot before in the Yiddish version. I have spent many a sleepless night and I worried lest, God forbid, I should get into melancholy thoughts. And that is why I often got up at night and spent the sleepless hours with it. My dear children, I do not set out to make uh, and write a moral book for you. I'm not capable of doing that. Uh, that is what our uh, wise people are for. We have uh, who have written many books about it. We have our holy Torah so that we can see and understand everything from it that is useful to us and that brings us from this world to the life of the thereafter. And to our dear Torah, we can cling. For example, there was a ship with people sailing on the sea. One of them went on board the ship and stooped so much into the sea that he fell into the water. The skipper saw this and threw him several ropes. The moral of this story is, even when we sin, God the Almighty saves us from drowning. That was Glückel's method of education, one that worked. Her language, the Jewish-German, is relatively easy to understand. Even and these are my concluding ground. Even the uh, anti anti Semite Martin Walzer noticed that it belongs to the German language family when he met the modern classic of Yiddish literature, Mendele Meuche Schworim. Uh, and his true name was Sholem Yankev Abramovich, who lived from 1835 uh, to 1917. He even dedicated a booklet to him, Schmeckendike Blumen, Fragrant Flowers, and a lifelong despiser of Jews. So he suddenly discovered at the age of 90 that, quote, we killed our own people, end of the quotation. For these, what he, as a Germanist, uh, had uh, until then repressed or refused to know, spoke a sociolect uh, or a dialect, if you like, uh, that had evolved. Uh, and for a Germanist, this is a very late uh, finding. And that is the irony of fate or history, which might help uh, thanks jurists, today's jurists, to correct their misconception after all. Thank you.